on the lattices that we use, on the lattices we use in ALF. So, Flo, the floor is yours. Thank you. I are prepared, Flo. Kind of. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, let's see. No, no. Now you should see yes. title and a lot of black boxes that we still have to remove. Okay. Now I think we can begin. So um, welcome to this uh, overview. Uh, presentation on hopping matrices in the ALF software packages. Uh, my name is Florian Good, and yeah, today we're talking about the hopping matrices. Um, what are we going to talk about a bit today? Um, I will show you the, we will talk, we will um, work out from the general Hamiltonian, the hopping Hamiltonian, uh, the, well, what, what its general structure is. Um, we will do a brief um, overview about the idea of the checker body composition. Um, uh, I will uh, talk a bit about the entries in, that go into the hop, uh, hopping matrix, and then we work on the um, uh, the toy example again, how the hopping matrix looks for the Hubbard model and the operator type that we use here. And then at the end, I will give you an outline of the currently predefined structures that you can use. Okay. So you pro you're probably familiar by now with the general Hamiltonian. So you have the hopping um, Hamiltonian part, the interaction, the um, Ising field uh, coupling part, and a, fr a user specifiable uh, free action part. Um, and today we are focusing here on the um, <clears throat> hopping Hamiltonian part, which is by definition, in contrast to yesterday, not a, not a perfect square, but a quadratic form in the fermionic operators or a sum of quadratic forms. Um, okay, which are the constituents that we have here? So you ha we have this large sum with the fermionic operators, C dagger and CY. And the, uh, in the, the, the quadratic form between them is specified here by the uh, hopping matrix elements, Tx, uh, Xy. Uh, this can run along the full spatial dimension. So you have um, this X and Y sums run from one to N, uh, N dim, which is the spatial volume. You can have N flavors uh, parts of N that sum and additionally a sum over the colors. Um, and Additionally, you can also have multiple of these uh, hopping parts. Uh, there are two, uh, either, either your model requires that for whatever reasons or a natural extension that where that comes in in the code itself is code itself is due to the checker board decomposition such that a, um, a splitting of this matrix T is generated that gets uh, exploited later on for, for faster linear algebra. Okay. Um, on the so the operation that we derive from that, we require only the uh, the operation to be able to exp exponentiate that matrix efficiently and apply it onto other matrices. Okay. So <clears throat> this is where the checker body composition comes in, uh, since uh, it enables us to decompose. Uh, less sparse matrix, so to speak, into multiple, even, even sparser matrices. Uh, usually the hopping matrix is a sparse matrix. Um, and to be able to efficiently uh, exponentiate it, we decompose it into a sum of sub matrices, uh, such that we can rewrite the, the hopping matrix as a sum uh, from one to the number of checkerboard matrices over these checkerboard matrices. Now the checkerboard matrices have a, uh, can be efficiently value, evaluated since each sub matrix has the property that um, it's uh, only contains a couple of um, 
a couple of non-zero entries, which we know how to efficiently uh, exp exponentiate it. So the canonical example is usually the 1D chain with next nearest neighbor hopping. Uh, so the matrix usually has that pattern and I can decompose it into uh, two matrices where which de uh, decomposes now into uh, two by two blocks which do not talk to each other since the interaction with the next nearest neighbor would be mediated by <clears throat> the other matrix. And now that this matrix is block diagonal, uh, I can efficiently uh, exponentiate that matrix. Uh, <coughs> Sorry. Um, since it's only a composed of two by two, uh, and so, since it's only um, it's, since it's a block form of two by two matrices. And yeah, I have so therefore I can uh, pre-calculate the exponential of that. And the important property is that it has the same sparsity pattern as the original original matrix. Since so that I, I since I know I want to exponentiate this particular matrix, then I know that the exponential of it also has the same sparsity pattern. I do not uh, generate any fill in. That's what makes this operation uh, efficient. Okay. Of course, this was the 1D example. Um, in the code, you already find a couple of uh, predefined structures where uh, people have invested the time to figure out the checker body compositions for more complicated lattices. So we do already have um, the checker body compositions for square lattices. Here, the generalization is instead of two checkerboard families, as in the 1D example, you have four checkerboard families. Um, we have it for the n leg ladder, we have it for the square bilayer systems, for honeycomb lattices, but it has been worked out, and also for bilayer uh, bi honeycomb lattices. Um, so there is not much work for you to do. Um, this is already, uh, uh, or all of this is already defined in the predefined structures, and you can uh, easily use it by setting the respective flags in, in, the, in the function calls. Um, Okay. Uh, one thing I should I should not forget to mention: the checker body composition is uh, not for uh, is not for free, um, in the sense that you do get better performance out of your code since you do less linear algebra. But uh, you introduce an additional error due to the um, splitting of of into into sub matrices and, and um, evaluating the exponential separately. Okay. How do now these uh, uh, the entries of the hop tree hopping matrix look like? So we did invest quite some time uh, to um, figure out what the most general hopping matrix uh, um, could look like. And this is the form that you find somewhere in the documentation. So you have, it's, it's still a quadratic form. You have the fermionic operator C dagger and C over here. You have real parts, um, uh, you have a so-called non-magnetic hopping matrix over here. And uh, if you want to if work with magnetic fields, also you have to include um, these uh, Pyatt's, Pyatt's phase factors that, um, that you introduce into the hopping matrix such that you can use, this, such that you can introduce a magnetic vector potential, for example. Um, okay. And additionally, um, if you work with that, you have to respect the respective boundary conditions um, of your fermionic operators. So here in this notation, now you have the K and J indices. These are lattice indices. On top of that, you have the delta and delta prime indices. These are orbital indices within uh, your um, lattice indices. You have the magnetic vector potential. Um, usually it's along, uh, some, uh, some, uh, it's per, um, perpendicular to some direction. You have the so-called non-magnetic uh, hopping matrix. You have the flux quanta phi, um, where is it? Over here. Uh, and uh, you have the um, uh, gauge uh, down, uh, down here in the um, boundary condition. If you would, uh, usually you do not want to uh, set, uh, work this out, for, um, you might not want to work this out for yourself uh, due to, for, for that reason, there is a function call available in the, um, 
predef predefined uh, hoppings to work out this kind of generic hopping. This is a function that requires uh, basically um, only the entries that you, the physical entries that you that you want to work with. So you need to specify kind of the lattice, the magnetic potentials, the flux quanta, the how many flux quanta you want to use. Um, and where you actually want to uh, store that information afterwards. And then it will generate for you uh, um, a hopping matrix uh, that you can use um, in setting up the op, uh, op T entries for the, um, for in your Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is the most generic hopping that we could think of. Um, so uh, so in, then we will um, move on to an example for the Hubbard model on a square lattice. So there it's, uh, everything is much simpler, no magnetic field, um, no orbital structure. The lattice is well known. And we also know how this, uh, most of the time the matrix, the hopping matrix should look like. So similar to yesterday, how would you write uh, your Hamiltonian? So you have to specify that it's a submodule which um, gets its information from the Hamiltonian main module. That you have a, that your um, you have to define your Hubbard model that you want to implement that it derives from the Hamiltonian ba uh, base class, and that you have to you have to set uh, some information that you want to use. You have to the interaction, the dimensionality, num uh, the number of lattice sites, uh, the flavors and the colors, and the opt and op or v matrices. And to remind you, these you do not have to specify as entries in your Fortran code. You inherit them from the base class. Um, but nevertheless, you have to set them. Um, OK. The um, the inter uh, these inter uh, the, the the hopping matrices are use an identical structure as the um, interaction um, interaction matrices from yesterday, so they also utilize uh, the operator uh, for specifying its information. So if you want to if you want to uh, know uh, want to know the details of that data structure, you can find it in the operator mod file. What you will have to set as a user is uh, the num is the effective dimension of that uh, th uh, thing. You have to specify how many uh, um, uh, firm how many fermionic degrees of freedom are participating in this particular interaction vertex. So for that, you have you specify this uh, pr um, proje uh, projection vector over here. And uh, you have to specify the actual coupling matrix in, in the respective subspace of the, inter of the inter two, usually two interacting particles. Uh, well, it's not usually, it's always two interacting particles. Um, okay, and on top of that, you can specify the coupling strength itself. So this is given by G, and for the hopping matrix matrices, the constant alpha is usually set to zero, therefore unused. Uh, okay. As a uh, kind of outlook for the, if you specify the uh, the full hopping matrix for the Hubbard model, usually the O matrix is a full matrix of full rank. Uh, um, whereas if you specify the checkerboard decomposition, it gets split up into multiple smaller matrices, and but this is handled automatically for you. Uh, our Hamiltonians follow a certain convention for setting these things up. Uh, they, we, we have a separate routine for that, this ham hop function in the Hamiltonians where you, uh, where you set, set up the hopping. So first you have to um, allocate the array of the opt operators. In this example, it's um, only one since I specify a big one, uh, since I specify a big matrix without checkerboard. Uh, then I loop over the flavors for every of, um, of the, for every entry of the flavors I call op make. And then I, uh, then I loop over my lattice sites and set um, the entries of the matrix uh, to um, minus t, the inter minus um, to minus t, the interaction strength on those position where I actually have uh, where I actually have entries. 
Additionally, I can introduce a chemical potential on the diagonal. And um, yeah, I said the coupling uh, here, I've chosen to um, use uh, the G entry of the operator for the global D tau prefactor. And then I can call offset on that uh, data structure to, uh, in order to tell it to in initialize its, in its internal variables from the data I have just given to it. Now, if you have done that, you can uh, in your Hamilton, in your subroutine ham set, uh, you can just call ham hop. And together with um, the ham v function from yesterday, you have um, specified um, the interesting parts of your Hamiltonian. Uh, so, uh, what do you? What can you already use for specifying your? Um, currently, uh, so for specifying your Hamiltonians, there are a couple of already predefined structures. So you can uh, you can ask um, Alf to give you a hopping matrix on a square lattice, with uh, as a, with a lot of um, variables. So there is this default hopping parameters square function, where you, which um, which you can tell the chemical potentials. You can give different flux quanta in x and y direction. Um, the number of flux uh, quanta flavors, the lattice, well, the lattice should be a square lattice here. And then it generates for you these the respective matrix. Um, one, one, one question here, sorry to interrupt. Uh, right. can, you, can you maybe explain the, your notation here? So what is so i s and sigma so i can imagine what what is and sigma as well but what is s um sigma is the uh the, usually for the Hubbard model it would be the spin index uh, yes spin index and s um is an option uh, op optional sun indices these are usually uh, used for specifying one is one is one is flavor index the other is color index Okay, but then the chemical potential can only couple to the uh, color index. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, uh, it, uh, since it has no, uh, has no sigma dependency, you mean? Yes, but, but I mean... Yeah, 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 yeah you're, you're right. But, uh, but that's, I mean, you, one, one could also relax that condition to my, mu of S and sigma, right? So. Uh, technically, I see no reason why not. Uh, okay. you, you, you have no, you probably have no predefined function for it. No, the, the, answer is no. the answer is no, 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 no. It's that, that won't be possible because, because, the, because of symmetries. The code is written so that the, colors, the color index, sigma, that's what we call color, has an SUN symmetry. Okay. Right? So you agree that if I have a mu which does not couple to sigma, then I have, an, if, I, if I do an SUN transformation on this color index, then everything, be, everything remains invariant. Yes. And this is something we really use in the code. I see. Right, so, so, so if you start playing and trying to put in a mu, which is um, color dependence, then you, you cannot, you have to then uh, redefine your color to a flavor index if you want. I see, okay. So, so, so the color is an SUN symmetry, the flavor index is something which is block diagonal, okay? I see, so thanks. That's, so so this, this, these are symmetry-based uh, reasons where you, why you can't do it. I see, thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Can I, can I just follow up quickly on the uh, flavor index being block diagonal? Is So there's a constraint on that also. Uh, you can't... You can't have a generic copying where you switch flavors. So, so the, answer, the answer is yes. You so no, you can't. It's it's block diagonal because um, um, because the because it simplifies the determinant, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you need that. So if you say you want to hop between um, if you want to hop between a flavors. Then you you it's not a flavor index, so you would have to redefine your i if you want. The i is a is an index if you want, which would take into account the unit cell and also the orbital within the unit cell. Oh, okay. Right, and so you would have to define orbitals to hop between orbitals. So it's it's always a question of what how you rewrite stuff. Okay. You find that um, in the the reasoning for that in the beginning of the the alpha documentation how you where you see. 
which parts uh, or um, which of them is required for the block diagonal for the block diagonality for the determinant and which are uh, which you know for these is goes into a prefactory of the partition function and that's the reason why the generic Hamiltonian from the beginning of the talk is set up that way since it enables that uh, kind of rewriting for the determinants okay what else is there? Uh, there is the hopping on a honeycomb lattice. Um, so for uh, similar structure as uh, similar structure as before, and you can uh, there's a uh, function for just to just set the default hopping parameters on the honeycomb lattice, with which takes similar arguments as the square lattice. What you can also find in the documentation uh, there is um, the the predefined function calls for the square and honeycomb bilayer systems as well as for the n lag ladder systems. Uh, so how would you use them actually if you want to use them? Um, so you would uh, uh, you would um, the, the the you can try to, to utilize the predefined hoppings. There is the so-called topping matrix type, which uh, carries all the information that is that you have uh, that you can specify for the most generic uh, hopping part, and then you call this set default topping parameters here as kind of a placeholder for the lattice that you require, and if you have that, so the data structures of the hopping matrix are specified. And then you from these uh, from the entries in that matrix, you can call another function. So called to use you you use predefined hopping set opt, which generates the entries of the opt uh, of the opt matrices. This would be the workflow to actually utilize these functions. And then the opt entries are set, uh, which is re the required input for the BSS algorithm. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. So this uh, brings us to the end of this presentation. What is not covered here is the inclusion of uh, to, to the usage of the Ising fields and the coupling. For that, I refer you to the chap chapter on these Z2 gauge theories in the documentation. Um, and maybe you want to know more if you want to use it uh, for your own uh, kind of um, research, uh, the internal structure of the hopping matrix type that is used. Okay. And with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Flo. Thank you. There's a question. Yes. Yeah. Hi. So, um, thanks. Um, since 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 you already went through the effort of very nicely uh, introducing this periodic boundary condition option, would it be possible to compute also like overlaps between states of different fluxes? So something like um, psi. Uh, Cat of phi and bra psi phi plus delta phi. Mm -hmm. I have I have no idea. I wouldn't. Uh, somebody else may give the answer. <laughs> I have never asked that question myself. <laughs> um, so how do you? Um, so it, it's a it, it's a very good question, but a bit complicated to answer. What do you? Um, so what exactly do you have in mind? You want to have a, a ground state, for example, of a, a, a state with a twisted boundary phi? Yes. With a ground state with an other phi? Yes, correct. And then compute the overlap between the states. So computing overlaps is rather hard. Okay. Observable. That's the first thing. Yeah. I, so, so, um, <laughs> but bottom, uh, to, to put the question differently, so would it be possible to compute something like a Wilson loop in momentum space? Um, a Wilson loop. Um, so, so, um, how, so, what is the variable on which you define the Wilson loop? It's, it's basically some um, adiabatic transport or overlap between states in the momentum space. So, but you can you can do that also probably with twisted boundary conditions, like 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 this overlap of uh, different uh, states at, at different uh, twisted boundary conditions. 
and then and then bring that that once around the Brillo and so on. Yeah, that's a that is a, so that's a very interesting question. So it it's an so you would like to have a, an adiabatic evolution somehow. Yes. Um, somehow in imaginary time. In what? Uh, it's in the flux. Yeah, but how do I so? Um, so you see, do I understand correctly? You come from DMRG, so you think in terms of wave function, right? Yeah, that's the kind of the problem. I I, I need to get that's, used to thinking of observables. That's that that thing's a bit of the headache because you think in terms. I have a wave function. I have a boundary condition, and I can have another wave function with another boundary condition. I can calculate the overlap, and I can you know sort of go systematically from one to the other, right? Yes. And then this is hard. This is hard to realize for us for the moment, but I, I'd be very happy to think about it. So I don't, I don't have a better answer. Maybe somebody else has a better answer. Um, uh, I have a quick question too. Um, is uh, in alpha, is it generally assumed that the hopping matrices are static? As, a, as the simulation evolves, or could, um, you know, in principle, they be dynamic as well? You mean time dependent and imaginary time? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, oh. no, not necessarily that, but could I update them throughout the simulation? Uh, currently, you can't, I definitely can't update them through the Monte Carlo time. Mm -hmm. There's no such facility. <laughs> okay. The, and then uh, another question is, um, is it amenable to something like studying bond disorder? Could you, I mean, could we start, stay with the first question? I find it's interesting. Why do you, why would you like to do this? If I, if I may ask, just like, uh, or is it impossible? Is it like in, in principle, um, so like if you were studying some type of like nematic system, uh -huh. right, the, the nematic fields might affect the, the hopping between so then, sites. Then it's possible. And so if I, yeah, if I have some like, you know, boson fermion model like this, I could study the interaction between the dynamic pneumatic field and so then fermions. Should, yeah, so, so the answer is yes, this is possible. This is, I think Jonas, you're gonna to touch, touch on this this afternoon, you told me, correct? Yeah. Um, this, it, this, is, this, this goes as an interaction, right? Because it's a, as you said, it's a boson fermion interaction. So the, the modulation as a function of time or as a function of the dynamics of a boson field of the hopping, that is that is possible, but it goes under the category of interaction. You have to use those um, interaction vertices. So that that is in. Oh, okay. At the time, then you then you you, you then you the hopping matrix. It doesn't come in. It doesn't come in into the rubric hopping matrix. The hopping matrix is for the moment static. But if you have hopping, which is coupled to a dynamical variable, then that is something like an interaction. Okay. That you can build in if you if you ask Jonas this afternoon. Right, these VKs, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah because it's a C dagger I C of J, and then a bosonic variable, which which basically modulates the hopping dynamically as a function of something, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry. So now you had another question. Yeah, uh, uh, the other question is, um, could uh, I I promote these to be some type of quench disorder model? So the bonds would be. In principle, position dependent, but they're not actually dynamic. Uh, and then you said, then you do an average afterwards over your uh, over the twenty yeah. that you have generated. Technically, yep. not an issue. You have to specify these uh, in entries somehow. You might get different sign problems uh, for different realizations. Um, mm -hmm. of, of course, it's very expensive if you want to uh, average afterwards over them. Right. But in, in principle, I could just kind of naively just throw the bonds in and run it and, and get, you get a result. You can do that. <laughs> you, you, yes, you can. But just that you don't have a you don't have translation symmetry anymore, and so mm -hmm. you can't define a Bravais lattice. Essentially, you will have to say my model is basically is a is a unit cell. The whole lattice is a unit cell. And say, you know, I have one unit cell with a huge amount of orbitals, and I just specify the hoppings between the orbitals. 
Okay. You don't have oh, so, so it does then actually actually kind of break a few assumptions for how you break if I have to specify. Yes. So you break the assumption yeah. of, you know, we have this assumption of something, a unit cell, which is translation invariant. So suddenly when you put in quench disorder, then your whole lattice becomes a unit cell in our terminology. Mm -hmm. And you you have no you have no possibility. I think somebody was mentioning this. I think you have no possibility of self, I mean the self-averaging is strictly speaking not something you can do if you have just one, well, I mean, you can average over this order afterwards, but that is something else. Mm -hmm. But it's possible. Okay. Thanks. I think Andreas has a question. Uh, yes, so um, maybe uh, Johannes can also comment on that. So, um, it, it's like, uh, again, related to this topological business. So in, instead of measuring the Wilson loop or the Barry curvature and connection, you could also measure the polarization, which is probably then better suited for Monte Carlo. Um, so so, so did, you, did, you, did you do something like that then? Or how, how did you probe the topology of a model? And also, um, would it be possible from the Rene entropy to, to have a look at degeneracies? Because for periodic boundary conditions, if you're in a topological system, if you look at the um, if you look at the eigen uh, values of the ah no that's that's a problem because you would need to access the ah no actually yes because the topology should give you something like a lock of the degeneracy of the ground state. Uh, yeah. So okay, uh, I guess these were almost up to three questions. To answer the last one first. Um, yes, in principle, it is possible to calculate the, uh, you would have to calculate a few Rennie entropies, and then you look essentially for the um, central charge of the topology, the logarithmic corrections. Um, this might, be, so in, in principle, it's doable. It might be tough in practice because um, if your lattice is too small and the few, um, um, yeah, and uh, entanglement entropy cuts that you make uh, are getting close to the boundary, then yours can may I, be susceptible can I, to boundary effects. Can I interrupt, Johannes, for this question? Sure. So the question was the topological entanglement entropy, correct? To see if you have yes. topological order. So that is possible. That is extremely hard again, right? Because it's a subleading correction to the area law. Exactly. Yeah, but for no, for for um, if in, if you if you now think about a one D chain or something like that, if you have a degenerate ground state that will just multiply the Rennie entropy uh, according to the degeneracy of the ground state in a periodic. So just consider a ring. If you then introduce a bipartition, you will have edge states in a topological system, and these edge states states they cause a degeneracy of your ground state. Which is just um, well, deep, deep, that that's just dependent dependent of, of the model. But say the degeneracies do, then you will get a uh, you will get a factor logarithm of two in, in front of the entropy. I think. Um, so I I know that as you said, when you have topological ground states in one dimension, you might have uh, the the um, degeneracy of two, if you go to two dimensions and you think of spin liquids, you have this topological degeneracy uh, of the different sectors. But where I'm confused is I'm, I thought that these terms show up as Fakia said as uh, subleading correction. So the log two is there, yes, or variance of the log two because it actually also depends on then the braiding statistics in two dimensions. Yes, so, in, in so two they years, do show up but they show up as subleading corrections. And either you reach um, cuts that are large enough so that you can separate the leading order uh, area, uh, area law from the subleading order corrections, uh, or you start playing around with uh, designing multiple branch cuts and you subtract them in a scheme so that the leading order vanishes. Um, so in principle, yes, it's doable either by looking at subleading corrections to find this uh, topological content to the entanglement entropy, um, or by but that's that's is, is that that's the one that's uh, the one that you're talking about is dividing the system in three pieces, right, and then computing the subleading parts. Well, I think it's 
so for the subleading, yes. Uh, what I was having in mind, I think, um, who was the one? Uh, Roger Melko did this for the. That's the one. That's exactly the one. Spin That's liquid uh, case, where the idea was you you really design a whole geometry, so that you calculate multiple Rennie entropies where you add and subtract them such that the area law cancels and then. You actually also have corners in your cut, but it's designed such that even the corners cancel. So like all the geometric uh, contributions to the uh, entanglement entropy uh, are designed to vanish or to combine to zero. Uh, and what you are left with is the entanglement entropy from the topological degeneracy. Okay. Uh, but just uh, so 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 it's roughly you you cut this these entanglement entropies in a donut shape, and then you cut the donut into pieces. But you have to have a lattice that is large enough to, so that a donut fits into it. Sure. Yes. Where the donut still has a decent width, uh, and then it becomes challenging. Okay. Because you are, in the end. I guess it doesn't matter how you set it up, but you are looking for a small signal in the background of a larger one, being, okay. it, being it the subleading order or these uh, yeah, other tricks. Um, for, I thought your question had another aspect with the maybe- Yeah, there was another relation. Aiming between... at the flat band. Uh, yeah, well, you could, in, instead of measuring the Berry curvature or something like that, in order to extract a, the, the invariant, you could also just measure the polarization of your ground state. Yeah. Um, so if it's, if it's a, let's say, a, um, a dimerization that causes the uh, topological nature, like in a normal symmetry uh, protected topological insulator, something like an SSH chain, you have a dipole moment that you could measure. Yeah. Just link to the invariant. Yeah, it's a very interesting idea. I actually never thought about it in that way before to extract it from a Monte Carlo perspective. Uh, I think in general, one should be able to calculate dipole moments. It's space, yeah. It, it's I, I think it's trivial. If you have a density, if you have a space resolved density distribution, then you can co compute the polarization. So what people have done, which was very useful, was to postulate that there was a one-to-one -one mapping, if you want, between the ground state you have and a single band model and a band model. And um, out of this, they so that's an idea from Su Sheng Tsang, basically, you can define. Uh, one that you, you calculate the self energy essentially, and you define a one top one band topological insulator, right? A, a one band that's a topological Hamiltonian, it's called. So it's a band structure. You just look at the imaginary, the real, the real part of the self energy that renormalizes the band. And mm -hmm. then from this, you then use band structure methods to calculate um, churn uh, numbers. Uh, yes, that, 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 that's the thing with, which works, but there's a lot of assumptions. The other thing which also works, that was something which is which was pushed forward by um, what's the name of this Volovic, is to you can again if you assume that you have an underlying one band um, single particle problem, I think that's an assumption here, then you can define your topological invariance just with the Green's function. Yes, that's also something that uh, um, I forgot who did it, but uh, the winding number defined through the poles of the Green's function, right. that, that gives you also something that, that you can just measure in, mm -hmm. if you have the momentum space resolved Green's function and the frequency resolved. So you need both actually. So we had, we did, we did this, where one student did this for, for topological condo insulators and it worked rather well, right? But there uh, is, Rari, no, I, no, I, no, I remember, sorry. Did yes. that, but there is, I think there is a there's a general there's a general way of defining those top. I mean, I mean it's it's very easy to define a topological insulate a topological invariant for those green functions, and you just calculate this. You know? But this is this is for all for, for topology which is somehow linked to band topology. Right? Yeah, it's a band topology linked to chiral symmetry. Sorry, I think you need chiral symmetry to to have that. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe I'm not sure about that one. But, uh, but, uh, but then for the topological order, which is not linked to band topology, then you, then you have to do what, what Johannes said. And that's, that's, that I think is really hard. And I know I don't, it would be very nice to, to see how far we can get with that. But, but then can you also get, I mean, 
okay, no, I'm 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 still thinking about in terms of wave functions, but this Wilson loop, you can also think of that as a measurement of a projection operator, but that is equally hard, right? Yes, I guess so. I mean, it depends what you do. The Wilson loop can also be computed. I don't know if it, the, I mean, if you, if you know what the degrees of freedoms are, then you can compute the Wilson loop right away, right? If you have a gauge theory, and you know what the gauge, you know, it's basically the, the, the integral over a closed loop, if you want, of the gauge field, at least in, in, in lattice gauge theory. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you have, a, if you have a, many cases, we, if you, if you, I mean, in that sense, if you have access, if you want to the gauge field and you really simulate in the Z2 or the U1 gauge field, then in principle, it's pretty easy to define a Wilson loop just based on the fields. Yes, okay, but still you need to compute this overlap between the states, right? Or well, is it... The Wilson loop would just be the expectation value. Huh. It would just be an expectation value of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a string operator, which closes on itself. Okay, so I, I, I've, I'm not used to thinking yeah. about it like this, but maybe if you... This is, what, this is the way you, you think about the Wilson loop for a Z2 gauge theory. Okay. So, you, so it's something which you can measure. Of course, it's, a, it's an operator which is pretty long, right? It's a loop and you have to see, I suppose that you would like to make the loop bigger and see how it scales, you know, if it's an area law or a perimeter law or things like this. And then it may become a bit noisy, but in principle, it's, it's a possible thing to do. Ah, so, so now you're thinking about uh, string operators or? Yes, I mean, that is the Wilson loop. I mean, so maybe we have to find a dictionary between I mean, that's the way I understand the Wilson loop. Okay, so for me, the Wilson loop is uh, defined through the Berry connection, if I remember right. So it's just a derivative. So it's uh, it's the expectation value of the derivative of over the Bloch functions, and then integrated over the Berlin zone. Is that the turn number? Uh, you, yeah, if you want, yes. But I, I, I yeah. Look at that. Yeah, we should look. At but because it's it's basically an expectation value over the momentum derivative, you can probably also just rewrite it in, in, in terms of a real space thing, because just measuring position would be equivalent to measuring derivative and momentum, and then okay. it gets easier. OK, mm -hmm. very interesting. And then another question in your check about decomposition. Um, now, 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 now you, sh you showed how to do it for an open system, I think, but for a periodic system, wouldn't you have like a initial additional block in the top right or top or bottom left part of your hopping matrix? Uh, that's true. Um, so th that's why I said that, that's why I called it the very simple example. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, um, uh, it's it's uh, you you have check you can define check about composition for both both cases you have to um, put the uh, these far out of diagonal blocks into some uh, some of the entries it's not a problem okay conditions with got to open it's you can define check about decompositions for either one I'm not sure. yeah yeah. Or what is your particular? No, it was it was just my question slash remark. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, if um, I think it's actually time to for us to take a break. <laughs>